It's time for another episode of Remake or Rebreak. I've decided to drop the usual camera segments for this review only just to see what people think. Depending on people's feedback, I might bring camera segments back in the next roar. Anyways, last time we met, we looked at Ocarina of Time on Nintendo 64, GameCube, and 3DS. To promote the community tab, I put up a poll asking which review you guys wanted to see next, and you guys voted overwhelmingly for a roar of Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga on the GBA and Superstar Saga Plus Bowser's Minions for the 3DS. Just a reminder to keep your eyes in the community tab because it's the best place to find production updates, new EPG plays series, and new podcasts from the Inverse cast. Make sure to turn on notifications and you'll be all set. With that out of the way, let's jump right into the review. As many of you know, I'm not the biggest fan of traditional RPGs. I talked about my reasoning at length in the Klonoa Heroes review, but generally I find this genre doesn't hold my attention long enough to want me to see a journey through to the end. There are exceptions, like Chrono Trigger, Lost Odyssey, and Final Fantasy V especially, but that's about it as far as traditional JRPGs go. When it comes to the Mario RPGs, on the other hand, I'm an avid fan and collector. Paper Mario for the N64 especially happens to be one of my favorite, most replayed games. As contradictory as that may seem, my love for Mario RPGs very much informs my disconnect with the mainstream genre. Mario RPGs distinguish themselves from your typical Final Fantasy with their witty, well-localized dialogue, action command-driven battle systems, and their more sincere focus on the overworld half of the equation. The abundance of platforming especially gives these games a distinctly Mario feel. Though most traditional RPGs have some puzzle or exploration elements in the overworld, it usually feels like most of the focus goes into the battling half of the experience while the overworld elements come off as almost a formality. Something about the depth of your typical Final Fantasy dungeon just doesn't engage me nearly as much as anything from a Mario RPG. Although Paper Mario was my first exposure to the subseries, I was an illiterate six-year-old at the time and didn't truly experience the game until it re-released on the Wii in 2007. For all intents and purposes then, it was Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga that truly introduced me to the Mario RPG. In retrospect, this GBA classic shaped my childhood more than I realized, with its razor-sharp wit, over-the-top battle system, and colorful cartoony graphics. Recently in 2017, Alpha Dream and Nintendo re-released Superstar Saga on the Nintendo 3DS, this time under the title of Superstar Saga plus Bowser's Minions. For brevity's sake, I'll refer to this version as just Bowser's Minions. A full remake of the 2003 classic, Bowser's Minions overhauls numerous elements and adds a new gameplay mode in Minion Quest. As always, Remake or Rebreak is a review segment where I evaluate the classics of the past to see how well they hold up today, with a special emphasis on how well subsequent significant re-releases, which includes ports, remakes, remasters, reimaginings, etc., recreate and improve upon the original experience. Today, we'll focus on two questions. How well does Superstar Saga for the GBA hold up today as a game on its own? And how well does Bowser's Minions compare to the original release? Without further ado, let's get to it. Despite my recent efforts to minimize story discussion, another thing that all these 1998 games have in common is that you're allowed to skip through or otherwise speed up cutscenes in some capacity. <laughs> I think Superstar Saga's plot has a lot of positives that demand greater discussion. Superstar Saga opens with a goodwill ambassador from the Bean Bean Kingdom visiting Princess Peach and the Mushroom Kingdom. Tragedy strikes when the ambassador reveals herself to be the nefarious bean witch, Cacletta, who burglarizes Princess Peach's voice and disappears into the night sky. Eager to rein in Peach's newly explosive vocabulary, the Mario Brothers forge an unlikely alliance with Bowser to fly to the Bean Bean Kingdom, track down Cacletta, and recover the princess's voice. However, However, the trio are ambushed at the Bean Bean Mushroom border and separated from Bowser and his minions. What follows is a series of misadventures as Mario and Luigi explore the Bean Bean Kingdom's exotic locales and encounter the increasingly wacky locals. While the plot on its own may not sound like much, Superstar Saga falls neatly into the category of episodic fantasy road trip, like Alice in Wonderland or Journey to the West. The appeal is all about our relatable protagonists encountering crazy characters, zany locations, and wacky scenarios, rather than a complex narrative with 
with lots of moving parts. In that sense, Superstar Saga is infinitely entertaining and never ceases to amuse. I've been playing this game regularly for 15 years, and surprisingly, it still had me laughing out loud the whole way through. Much of Superstar Saga's lasting appeal stems from its unique setting. While a lot of Mario RPGs are content to simply reimagine the Mushroom Kingdom ad nauseum, Superstar Saga envisions a living, breathing world in the Bean Bean Kingdom, and fleshes out details you didn't even know you wanted to hear. There are a surprising number of adult jokes about passports, international borders, and even exchange rates. Superstar Saga also provides glimpses at several ancient civilizations that once occupied the Bean Bean Kingdom, which helps the world feel all the more authentic. However, it's the characters more than anything that contribute to the story's lasting appeal. All the NPCs are exceedingly memorable, from big players like Bowser to bit players like these two elemental spirits. The Bean Bean Castle cast especially grows on you over the course of the game, and each one of them has some unique quirk. Characters in general are hilariously expressive. I've got to give credit to the villains especially, which are always a highlight of these pre-Sticker Star Mario RPGs. In my opinion, the original Paper Mario absolutely nailed Bowser as a main antagonist, to the point where having him reprise that role just comes off as redundant even if recent games hadn't sucked out all of his character. Superstar Saga smartly relegates him to a tritagonist role, where he can do the most good. Kakletta and Fawful showcase excellently why it's best to focus on unique antagonists in Mario RPGs. Not only do these villains have extravagant designs and showcase unique abilities, but it's just fun watching them bounce off the Mario Brothers. Fafo in particular has become a fan favorite due to his English speech patterns in the North American localization. That's not even mentioning the Shadow Thief Popple, who serves as an analog to Croco and Junior Troopa from the previous games. Frankly, I think he's even funnier than the main baddies, and it's always great to see him show up again. I think the sound design of all things deserves a lot more credit than it's been given, which is especially commendable for a GBA game. Alonzo, it's time to record an episode. Oh. Hey, Michael. Uh, you see, uh... Ethan, wake what? up. All of these sound effects have been permanently etched into my brain. They're so cartoony and lighthearted, which kind of sums up Superstar Saga's plot as a whole. Playing this game just puts a smile on my face, and I was thoroughly entertained from beginning to end. This contrasts greatly with Ocarina of Time, which I covered last time. Despite having a similarly straightforward good versus evil narrative, and even barring the unskippable text, these cutscenes are boring to watch. The cinematography is bland, and PCs just stand in place the whole time, and the dialogue has no wit or character to it. I've replayed both games about as many times, and the fact that this plot still engages me just as much as ever showcases how important an engaging presentation is to lasting appeal. So how does the 3DS version fare? Pretty well, actually. As I've implied earlier, more recent Mario RPGs have failed to stack up in terms of plot, which is why I appreciate Alpha Dream and Nintendo going back to square one, so to speak. Perhaps it will help them to better realize what was lost in more recent games and improve accordingly. Regardless, I find that Bowser's minions at once preserves, improves, and detracts from the story presentation over the original. To start, the original dialogue is preserved nearly word for word and is just as amusing as ever. There are a couple minor tweaks I'll discuss later on, such as a handful of new lines added for the previously silent Koopalings. Despite early speculation that Bowser's minions would homogenize the previously kooky character designs a la New Super Mario Bros., Bean Bean NPCs remain as crazy as ever, with only a few exceptions. Several people have insisted to me that Bowser's minions isn't as expressive as the original, but 
Personally, I don't see it. When you compare these cutscenes side by side, the 3DS sprites are anything but inexpressive and largely carry over the most memorable expressions. At the same time, I find that Bowser's Minions also improves over the original by helping to bring the plot in line with later series continuity. Looking at the original GBA art direction, there are certain aspects that haven't aged well. The toads have strange proportions for one, and Bowser looks like a tiny gremlin and lacks the gruff personality he developed from Game 3 onward. In addition, series mainstays like Goombas and Koopas look kinda strange. You can pin this on Superstar Saga being the first game in the series, but details like this stick out in 2018. That's why I appreciate the 3DS version for bringing in the typical character designs from later games and even subtly tweaking Bowser's characterization. A couple story details were altered as well, such as Dr. Toadly substituting for Psycho Kamek in the Hypnosis subplot. This leaves things open for Kamek's appearances and partners in time in Paper Jam while setting up Dr. Toadley's introduction in Bowser's Inside Story. Furthermore, on the Minion Quest side, the new game mode helps to flesh out details in what Bowser and his minions were doing this whole time. Details like how an amnesiac Bowser met Popple, what the Koopalings were up to before the final dungeon, etc. These subtle changes improve continuity with later games while preserving the elements we love to begin with. Bowser's Minions also carries over a much appreciated addition from Paper Jam, the ability to fast forward through any cutscene in the game. While I was personally too engaged to use this during normal cutscenes, it was a godsend during tutorials. Unfortunately, not everything about the 3DS transition necessarily works out for the better. As much as the reworked cutscenes work visually, I find that the sound design isn't nearly as good as the original. Like I said, the GBA sound effects were incredibly cartoony and extremely memorable. The 3DS sound pack, by comparison, comes off as incredibly generic and understated. <laughs> Also, I found that the game couldn't consistently choose a higher low-pitched dialogue noise for NPCs. Bowser especially comes to mind. <laughs> These might seem like nitpicks to some, and maybe it's the nostalgia talking, but I do honestly feel that some of the original's charm is lost as a result. Regardless, I'd say the 3DS story presentation is an improvement overall. Aesthetically, the GBA doesn't exactly have a reputation for excellent visuals and sound, and in that sense, Superstar Saga has aged remarkably well. It's worth noting that I recorded Superstar Saga on a DS capture card for maximum authenticity and maximum graphical fidelity. You guys all know how much I like bright, colorful visuals and Superstar Saga doesn't disappoint. This is another area where the Bean Bean Kingdom setting really shines. Rather than recycling the Mario 3 level tropes we've seen a million times, as varied and time-tested as they are, Superstar Saga offers a plethora of unique and memorable locations that feel like real places, low-definition graphics withstanding. The environments in this game are some of the most creative and visually engaging on the system, from the peaks of Hoo Hoo Mountain to the bowels of Joke's End. Despite being stereotypical locations to some extent, the Bean 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 treatment helps them to stand out as their own thing. This also applies to NPCs. Instead of interacting with a bunch of samey, nameless toads, you'll meet creatively designed NPCs of various races. The sprite work itself is well drawn and well animated for the system, to the point where much of it was reused for the DS games. I've already praised the sound design, but the music deserves kudos as well. You're likely familiar with Yoko Shimomura of Kingdom Hearts fame, who also composed most of Legend of the Seven Stars in the SNES. She returns for Superstar Saga, and while it's not quite up to the level of Dream Team or Kingdom Hearts 2, it's still a solid offering all around. Most of the highlights come from area themes, particularly Teehee Valley and Oho Oasis, while most of the low points concern the more atmospheric tracks, particularly Woohoo University and Joke's End. The latter especially is one of the most needlessly repetitive and grating tracks in the entire series. <laughs> Thank you. 
The battle themes, on the other hand, are pretty good, but I personally found the main boss theme to be a tad bland. One thing's for sure though, the GBA sound hardware didn't hold Yoko back. On a system infamous for its low resolution sequenced audio and low quality samples, the instrumentation here manages to sound better than even most first party games. As far as Bowser's minions goes, I was at first apprehensive about the new visual design. Like before, I played and recorded Bowser's minions on my 3DS capture card so that I could experience the game on the intended form factor and get the best possible footage. The previous 3DS games had transitioned the series to 2D sprites rendered over fully 3D backdrops. While this move has been surprisingly controversial, I personally consider Dream Team one of the best looking games on the 3DS. The new 3D environments managed to capture the je ne sais quoi of previous games perfectly, while the 2D graphics blended well with them. For this reason, I was eager to see how my favorite Bean Bean locales would look in 3D and raised an eyebrow when I found out Bowser's minions would return to top-down orthographic 2D. However, as I grabbed stock footage of the other 3DS games for this review, it really jumped out at me how inconsistent the frame rate could get, especially during visually intense battles. Bowser's Minions, by contrast, runs at a rock solid 60 FPS at all times, so at least it's got that going for it. As for the quality of the 2D art itself, I think Alpha Dream did a really good job balancing the increased simultaneous colors in 240p resolution, while also blending in with the 3DS sprite set. Moreover, it's it's nice to see some of my favorite Bean Bean locales reimagined on the 3DS, particularly Stardust Fields and Joke's End. Ultimately, it never felt like the transition back to 2D environments detracted from the overall visual fidelity. That said, if you've played the previous 3DS games, you're bound to notice how many assets were reused from those games in both art and sound. This is particularly obvious with the Elite Trio, who wear their special Elite Guard hats from Dream Team despite not having reached that rank as of this point in the series timeline. Nevertheless, I'm not sure what it is about the 3DS sprite set that people don't like. Maybe we just aren't used to seeing alpha anti-aliasing used on sprites, despite it being expected for 3D models. This contrasts with the original Mario & Luigi art design where anti-aliasing is limited to gray pixels on the edges, which creates the illusion of rounded edges on the original screen. Here's the part where I meme it up by saying you don't really know what a handheld game looks like until you've seen it on the intended screen. When it comes to anti-aliasing, both games look different and better when viewed on those tiny LCD screens. One thing I noticed while recording stock footage of Partners in Time and Bowser's Inside Story is how the environmental design in both games also uses a heavy dose of anti-aliasing, as opposed to the screen-popping jaggies used in the first game. In that sense, I think the visual designers did a good job carrying over the look of the DS environments while also taking advantage of the 3DS's increased capabilities. It seems like the logical next step from the visuals in Game 3. Personally, I can get down with both, but in this case, I prefer the new sprites for the extra detail, increased simultaneous colors, and additional animation frames. I also prefer the new environments on the whole, but it can be jarring how some overworld objects lack anti-aliasing, sticking out like a sore thumb. On the whole, i definitely say Bowser's Minions takes advantage of the 3DS's greater capabilities, despite the lack of stereoscopic 3D. I'd imagine it would be hard to add 3D in a fully 2D game, and and I can't say I really missed it, but whatever. Sound-wise, I'd say the transition is neither overtly positive or negative. Many of the weaker, ambiance-focused tracks on GBA see a noticeable improvement on 3DS, such as Agony, Chucklehuck Woods, and Woohoo Hoo University. Joke's End especially is so much more listenable here than it ever was on GBA. I'd also have to single out many of the area themes and most of the boss themes as preferable in Bowser's Minions, particularly the Bean Bean Kingdom Overworld theme. The 3DS soundtrack simply has a richer sound and higher quality instrumentation, which makes the music better to listen to. However, and my nostalgia may be flaring up again, but some tracks just don't sound right without those bit-crunched GBA samples. Between this game and the version from Paper Jam, it's clear that there's something about the main battle theme that Yoko seemingly can't recreate on 3DS. Without those low quality GBA instruments, it just doesn't sound right.
Teehee Valley, which is one of the best pieces from the original game, suffers a similar fate. Without spoiling too much, the final boss theme also severely downgrades the electric guitar that made it so great, despite playing up the church organ. On the whole, I'd say Bowser's Minions scrapes out a net positive sound-wise, but there are certain tracks I'll always prefer on GBA. Of course there's gameplay in this video game, so let's talk about that. Unlike the previous two Mario RPGs, which are more traditional in the sense that Mario worked alongside other party members, Superstar Saga cuts this all down to the eponymous brother duo. You control the Mario Brothers together as you navigate a top-down overworld, all the while collecting items from blocks, solving puzzles, and coming across enemy encounters. Unlike many traditional JRPGs, Superstar Saga crafts a healthy balance so that I'm never battling or exploring long enough to get of either. Like all Mario RPGs, Superstar Saga features a significant amount of platforming, which makes exploring the overworld all that much more exciting and engaging. Part of what makes platforming so interesting is the use of hammers and hand abilities, which have a variety of puzzle uses, as well as brothers moves, which allow the brothers to clear difficult jumps or navigate cramped passages. Unlike future games, you're allowed to switch the brothers' positions, which is oddly enough mapped to start and not select. The downside to all of this is you're going to be mashing those shoulder buttons an awful lot, and by the time you get hand abilities it becomes a lot to juggle. Later Mario and Luigi games, especially Partners in Time, tend to get a lot of flack for their linearity, but playing this game again, I didn't really feel much of a difference. The order you're allowed to explore each area of the Bean Bean Kingdom is carefully railroaded using progression gates, despite how expansive and open the overworld may seem. While there are side quests and side areas you can access from the get-go, did somebody I say side quests? The side content is staggeringly light compared to other Mario RPGs, and I never got the sense that Superstar Saga was more open world than later entries. Nevertheless, I would say this first game is better at disguising the railroad tracks than future titles. For one thing, past the first leg of the Beanstar Hunt, you're allowed to acquire the remaining three shards in any order, an idea which would only resurface in Dream Team's Ultibed quest. As far as the side content goes, there's not nearly as much to talk about about as there was with Ocarina of Time. One of the biggies is Har Hall's design studio, a sort of puzzle game where you try to assemble uniquely colored and patterned outfits. It's fun at first, but it starts to get pretty repetitive by the end. There's a couple of fetch quests you can complete in Bean Bean Castle Town, as well as hidden caves and platforming sections on the overworld, all of which reward you with special items. This includes two Thwomp Caves where you can gamble coins and hopefully unlock two Secret Brothers moves. Superstar Saga also features a wealth of hidden bean spots that uncover Chuckle Beans. Speaking of which, there's a long-form side quest involving the Star Beans Cafe, where you can exchange different bean types from across the kingdom for espresso that boosts various stats. Professor Egad of Luigi's Mansion fame even shows up for a handful of cameos and rewards new drinks with special accessories. The other bean types are won from defeating enemies, striking invisible blocks, and winning them from minigames. Speaking of minigames, these are another cornerstone of the Mario & Luigi experience, but Superstar Saga probably focuses on them the most. These can range from collecting gems in a minecart, matching up colored barrels, deflecting attacks at Octorok likes, and literally jumping the Bean Bean Mushroom border. You're required to beat the first round of all of these minigames to finish the game, but none of these alternate gameplay styles are so difficult as to block your progress. If you're in the mood for side quests, you can revisit these minigames to take on harder challenges, such as new border jump patterns or minecart courses. You are forced to replay the first challenge in these cases, but the higher level you play, the more beans you'll earn. Personally, I'm not the type to shoot down alternate gameplay styles within reason, and I felt the minigames offered welcome variety. That goes for the other side quests as well, even if the rewards aren't always great. Bowser's Minions offers a plethora of improvements to the overworld gameplay, many of which debuted in Partners in Time and Paper Jam. With two larger screens to work with, Bowser's Minions delegates the overworld to the top screen and a full-sized map to the bottom. Using the stylus, you can peek over any part of the overworld you've explored and even put down Samus Returns-esque markers to keep track of outstanding bean spots and unreachable side quest opportunities. This is a big improvement over the original, where the only way to view a map was to find them hanging on walls. More importantly, the bottom screen also provides a convenient way to switch between Mario and Luigi's moves a la Paper Jam. While you can still use the shoulder buttons if you want, it's way more convenient to simply tap what you want. Also like Paper Jam, the X button acts as a jump button for both brothers, allowing you to map hammers or hand abilities to A and B while jumping with X. 
remakes. Oh, and I don't know how I forgot this, but much like the other 3DS games, the remake introduces full analog movement for significantly smoother control. Of course, you can still use the D-pad if you need help lining up a shot or something. Once you've played Superstar Saga this way, going back to the original can feel almost archaic. Bowser's Minions also carries over additional side quests and information. For example, you're given a counter as to how many buried chuckle beans reside in each area, which along with the map markers makes it a lot easier to get them all. Additionally, hidden sound test tracks are scattered throughout the kingdom, including both the GBA and 3DS versions of the full soundtrack. It makes you wonder why there isn't a heart gold esque music toggle so you can listen to the GBA tracks in game, especially if the sound files are already on the cart. The new map feature certainly makes it a lot easier to keep track of where you've been and where you haven't, allowing me to easily find side content I had missed in my first run on GBA. Finally, there's a new achievement side quest, which can range from performing moves correctly or collecting a certain number of items. This side quest is overseen by this NPC, who previously would give you overpriced hints in the original. Now, instead of stealing your coins for something you can look up online, he gives away free stuff for simply playing the game. Why I didn't bother with all the achievements, I'm sure hardcore completionists will enjoy the addition. With the overworld side covered, it's time to talk about the battling, which also takes a lot of inspiration from previous Mario RPGs. When it comes to battle systems and RPGs, I find that there's a fine line between boring and overly complicated. What's always been great about Mario RPGs and why I think they outperformed the mainstream is that they consistently manage to strike a healthy balance. Superstar Saga is no exception, managing to avoid pitfalls on either side. Essentially, you're looking at a typical turn-based system with some welcome mechanical challenge thrown in for good measure. You control Mario and Luigi, selecting from jump attacks, hammer attacks, and hand attacks. The first two work better on certain enemies depending on whether spikes or wings are in the equation, while hand attacks introduce elemental weaknesses and immunities. That's all typical so far, but Superstar Saga also implements some well-disguised minigames. Enemy attacks can all be dodged using your hammer or jump attacks, and in many cases you can counter enemies as well. Each enemy has unique tells for their various attacks to showcase which brother they're aiming at and what trajectory they'll use. So you're encouraged to learn enemy patterns to minimize damage taken and maximize counterattack offense. And make no mistake, that's no easy feat. Mastering the various enemies and their quirks can take a few battles, and even after a decade and a half, I still got hit once in a while. In addition to enemy dodging minigames, Superstar Saga utilizes a brother's move system. Provided Mario and Luigi are both conscious and stocked up on BP, they can attack enemies together. These amount to a QTE minigame where you try to press the A and B buttons in the correct sequence. Depending on how many presses you nail, the damage output of the attack increases. Personally, I think Brothers attacks are something that greatly improved in later entries. They got so over the top, and the minigames themselves were more challenging and engaging rather than pressing the same basic button sequences for the entire game. That said, a lot of these future attacks could drag on for quite some time, so at least these moves are short and sweet. That's not to mention the advanced moves, which you unlock by successfully performing Brothers attacks a specific number of times. These advanced moves do everything from drilling into spiked enemies to repeatedly smacking Mario like a racquetball against opponents, an incentivized mastery of each brother's attack. Unfortunately, the advanced moves showcase the game's greatest flaw, that being how it tutorializes the brother's attacks themselves. While the game acts like you can set the movement speed to slow and learn the button inputs that way, in practice I found it unhelpful. That's just speaking of the vanilla moves. Advanced moves can be a complete crapshoot to figure out on your own, particularly Swing Brothers and Cyclone Brothers. I had to visit Mario Wiki to figure out how to use these moves properly. Thankfully, Bowser's Minions greatly improves on this issue. The revised Jump and Hammer action commands from Game 3 onwards replace the simpler versions from the original, and while they are more satisfying attacks to use, it means the remake tweaks enemy stats to compensate. While attacks are slightly slower paced than in the original, the button press prompts are given more advanced notice, making it easier to learn as you go. If that's not enough, you're also allowed to demo new brothers moves and practice them until you get the timing down, just like future games. Advanced moves are also recategorized as Super Brothers moves and incur different BP costs. The trade-off is that they are easier to learn and perform. Additionally, I found that certain moves were simply more fun to pull off, specifically Fire Brothers. This move was agonizingly slow on the GBA, but it's much faster paced on the 3DS and I found myself using it way more often. While there are drawbacks in terms of speed and BP costs, this new system is way more beginner friendly and also adds some welcome balancing to what were previously very spammable moves. As for difficulty, Superstar Saga crafts a welcome challenge, and
enemy encounters last just long enough to make enemies feel like a threat. While you can dodge or counter all of the enemy's attacks, this takes practice and observation. Bosses will pose a greater challenge than normal mooks, but you won't have to grind for hours to simply push forward. That said, I was having so much fun battling enemies that I actually fought all the possible encounters in both versions of the game. That's the sign of an engaging battle system if I've ever seen one. Speaking of bosses though, that's where the game seems easier than I remember. When I was a kid, I didn't really understand the importance of building balanced stats through leveling up. I just kind of ran past everything and brute forced my way through bosses. It worked better than you'd think, but it meant that a lot of bosses became endurance rounds. That's why it will always feel weird to come back to this game and see how fast and easy bosses go down when you're actually prepared. Bosses themselves are hardly the best in the series or in video game history, but they serve their purpose. A lot of people have interpreted Bowser's minions as easier than the original overall, and I suppose in terms of brothers attacks, that's somewhat true. For the most part, I find the remake more or less the same difficulty as the original. If anything, it might be slightly harder thanks to increased BP costs and stat rebalancing, but I never noticed a significant difference in my back-to-back -back playthroughs. That is, with one major exception. Ah, spoiler alert! The final battle with Cacleta's soul always came off as a major difficulty spike to me, even with me battling every possible encounter. Like I said, I didn't find any of the bosses leading up to the endgame to be unreasonable, not even the Koopalings with their time limits. Cacleta's soul, meanwhile, can be brutal even if you're well prepared with items, equipment, and stats. For some reason, she gets to attack as many times as she feels like, and figuring out how to damage her took a little too long for my tastes. Even once you lower her guard and reveal her weakness, you only get to attack for a little bit before it goes away and you start over again. You have to repeat the cycle like five times and it drags on for like 20 minutes. That's not Final Fantasy 13 bad, but compared to how well paced the rest of the game was, the final boss stands out. I understand that a final boss should cap off a game's difficulty curve, but needless repetition doesn't make for a gratifying challenge. Surprisingly, Cacleta's soul is even more difficult on the 3DS. Not only did the first phase with Bowletta last longer than before, the soul phase actually took me about a half hour to clear. Despite the boss being a 3D model this time, I somehow found a lot of these attacks harder to dodge than before, and the actual boss design hasn't really improved over the past 15 years. While I personally think the 3DS version is worse off in this regard, some people might see this as a welcome increase in difficulty. For better or worse, Kekleta's soul is harder on 3DS than on GBA. While that covers the bulk of the gameplay, there are actually quite a few random changes on the 3DS that I thought I ought to mention. A lot of these are tiny details, but I think people like this kind of stuff on Roar, so what the hell. This is hardly a comprehensive list, so if you notice something I didn't, you don't have to kill me. Alright, speed round. 1. Some additional warp pipes have been added to the Winkle Realm and Hoo Hoo Mountain, for example. 2. Heart blocks from later MNL games are now available alongside save blocks. 3. He Bean blocks now have a distinctive outline, making them easier to find than before. 4. When bosses take enough damage, they enter a rage mode and beef up their attacks. 5. Defeating the virus enemies with color matching now plays a jingle from Dr. Mario. 6. The block minigame in the Hooniversity is now treated as an in-universe research project rather than a random minigame that comes out of nowhere. 7. Hand attacks charge and dispel faster, making for faster paced battles. 8. Gritty Goombas are slightly harder to counter due to the new graphics. 9. The minigame themes have been replaced with the tutorial music from Partners in Time, the minigame music from Dream Team, and one of the Toad Hunt themes from Paper Jam. Similarly, the Hammerhead Brothers Cave now plays the Bean Bean Fields theme instead of the Hoo Hoo Village theme. 10. Bink has changed from a Donkey Kong skeleton to a random skeleton man. 11. Similarly, Gino's cameo in the Little Fungi Town minigame has been removed for presumably legal reasons. 12. Barrels refilled noticeably faster in the barrel minigame. 13. The giant goofy Koopas are now generic green Koopas. 14. Chocolo Bounce now maps rotation to the shoulders rather than A and B, making for smoother control. 15. Fawful's second boss battle now uses the Cacleta boss theme instead of Popple's boss theme. 16. Run 
running away from battles does not cause you to drop coins. 17. Much like the other 3DS games, you can save whenever you want and not just at an album. 18. Similarly, dying in battle does not kick you back to the title screen and allows you to try again from the beginning of the fight. Here's a couple more things I was reminded of while editing this review. 19. While saving on the GBA takes a solid 8 seconds of silence, saving on the 3DS is nearly instantaneous. 20. While the Yoshi Theater posters in the original advertise games that were out in the early 2000s, the posters in the remake all nod to characters introduced in later Mario and Luigi games. 21. While the original game required you to platform about before you could swim at a certain height, the remake allows you to swim all the way to the ceiling in each room from the get-go. 22. While Blablondon gives us this shit-eating grin in the original when Dragon Ho-Ho hatches from the egg, this reaction face has been completely removed on the 3DS. 23. Finally, in the Beanstone search throughout Castletown, Mini Mario's sensitivity to the stone locations has been greatly increased, and the side quest is better off for it. I'm sure there are additional differences, but that's what I happen to notice. Of course, the biggest addition to Superstar Saga plus Bowser's minions is well, the minions. After a certain point in the main story, the option to play Minion Quest will unlock in the Superstar Saga Pause menu. Minion Quest follows Bowser's minions as they try to regroup with Bowser and the Koopalings following Kakletta's attack on the Koopa Cruiser. The story specifically follows the exploits of Captain Goomba, who is unappreciated by his superiors and uses the crisis as a way to prove his worth to the Koopa Troop. Later on, he teams up with the Captain Shy Guy and Captain Boo, all the while recruiting more minions on their search for Bowser. As a sort of foreshadowing, of Bowser's inside story, the plot also features Fawful brainwashing stray minions and the Koopalings, requiring the three captains to defeat them in battle to shake them from their trance. Like I mentioned earlier, there's an abundance of references to future games, which helps to better tie this game into the series' continuity. So story-wise, Minion Quest is definitely interesting and a fine addition to the series' canon, but it does have a few flaws. For one thing, why don't the elite trio of Private Goop, Sergeant Guy, and Corporal Paraplonk from Bowser's inside story take the lead roles. They do appear as a sort of rival group to the three captains, but I can't be the only one who would much rather play as established characters than generic nameless mooks. Regardless, the cutscenes and fan service are easily the best part of Minion Quest on the whole because, frankly, the gameplay is hot garbage. I would loosely describe Minion Quest as a strategy game where you form teams of recruited minions to take down opposing mooks. The game is laid out in worlds set in Bean Bean locales with each offer stages where you'll take on preset waves of enemy forces. Minions come in melee, ranged, and flying varieties, and this order serves as a weakness circle of sorts. As such, you're encouraged to pay attention to the mooks you're facing and assemble a team that will perform well against them. Each wave will end when you take down the enemy captain, but if your captain falls, then you lose the stage and have to start over. Winning rounds will snag you experience points, item drops, and even new recruits you can add to teams in the future. At the end of each world, you'll take on boss characters, chiefly Koopalings, as you struggle to re assemble the Bowser baddies and reclaim the Koopa King himself. That may sound fine on the surface, but as you get into the meat and potatoes of the gameplay stew, you quickly notice how undercooked it is. Now, I think it's worth stressing that a secondary mode based on strategy gameplay wasn't necessarily a bad idea. RPGs are all about analyzing opponents' weaknesses and forming a strategy to get the best possible outcome. Considering the variety of enemies in the Mario franchise, it could make for a fun strategy game if done well. I should also point out that I personally have little experience with the mainstream strategy genre. I haven't played a single Fire Emblem game, nor Age of Empires, Halo Wars, Starcraft, etc. The most exposure I have is finishing Pikmin 3 on the Wii U, but that gives me at least some background as to what the expectations are for this genre. Chief among those being that players must have total control over their forces at all times, be they Pikmin, soldiers, or UNSC personnel. That's what makes strategy games strategy games, sifting through all your units to figure out which are most effective against what and planning several steps ahead so you can win the day. After all, it would be really frustrating if your Pikmin just did whatever the hell they wanted with no possibility of input from the player. And that's precisely why Minion Quest fails as a strategy game. Mechanically, it's one of the shallowest games I've ever played. From the very beginning, battles with enemy forces are almost completely automated. You're not even allowed to control 
your captain. All your forces will automatically target whichever enemy and butt heads until one of them drops dead. The only input you really have is deciding when and how you use your captain's special moves, which use up a stock of captain points. These range from randomized stat buffs to playing dead to refuel your health bar. Otherwise, the only button input comes from each unit's special moves, which are triggered whenever the game feels like it. By timing or mashing the A button, you can deal extra damage against opponents or activate buffs. Besides the occasional button press, the outcome of battles is almost entirely up to the computer, and the computer itself is as dumb as a sack of bricks. Rather than intelligently guarding the captain or targeting enemies they're strong against, your units will just fuck off and do whatever. Meanwhile, the enemy will intelligently gang up on your captain and pummel you in quick succession. During the first act of minion quest, the poor ally AI doesn't really matter too much. The enemy is weak enough that you could brute force your way through stages. Once you reach Chucklehuck Woods, however, the limitations of such an automated system become strikingly apparent, as stages become longer and enemies become tougher. Now, automation aside, the player is in total control of which and how many units of the three types they bring into battle. This is pretty much the only real influence the player has in the outcome of battle, seeing as they can't actually control their forces in real time. Unfortunately, even this is kind of a crapshoot. While the game will tell you what kinds of enemies you'll fight in a given stage, it won't tell you how many will appear or in what formation. In addition, later stages start throwing in spiked enemies and other rule breakers that are difficult to prepare for. No matter how strategically you form your team, you'll never know whether you've chosen correctly until it's already too late. By that point, the game will flat out tell you what to bring. That just incentivized me to purposefully lose because that's the fastest way to figure out what units to bring. Even with the right units, the automated nature of battles always makes the outcome feel more luck-based than anything, which betrays the point of the strategy genre. A good strategy game rewards intelligence, foresight, and understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of your subordinates. Minion Quest, meanwhile, decided it would be a great idea to incorporate stats and levels into the mix for individual recruits. This means you can use the exact units the game tells you to use and still lose because your stats are too low. While you are allowed to replay old missions to beef up your stats, who would honestly ever want to do that? It's not like Superstar Saga itself where I can take a break with puzzles and platforming between battles. Fighting enemies is all you do, and it was boring boring the first time around. Some of these battles can go on for a really long time too, with up to four waves of enemies. After a while, playing stages started to feel like I was banging my head against a brick wall just trying to push forward. Where Minion Quest fails the most is that it simply isn't fun to play. Personally, I found it mind-numbingly boring even more than I found it frustrating. I suppose that's what happens when you make a game mode that literally plays itself most of the time. It's like watching paint dry. I mean, just take a look at these intense boss battles. It's about as intense as the shadow hang glider sections from Sonic 06, two of which you can win by literally doing nothing. You know, I actually finished Enter the Dragonfly and Season of Ice two times apiece for my Let's Play channel. They could get a bit tedious at times, the latter especially, even so I was still having fun collecting stuff, killing enemies, and platforming around. Even Pac-Man World GBA had some fun to be had. The reason I couldn't finish Minion Quest is that it's simply not entertaining. Of course, that's just my opinion, but that's the name of the game in a subjective review. By the time I reached this fork in Guarhar Lagoon, I was fucking done. I had finally reached the point where the only way forward was to grind, and I wanted no part of that. If I really wanted to, I could probably go back and grind to push my way through minion quest, but why should I? Just so I can say I endured all this tedium long enough to finish it? I pretty much knew everything I needed to review Minion Quest after the first hour. Even if I did grind my stats past the latest hump, who's to say there won't be a similar hump in the next world, or the one after that? For all I know, Minion Quest could get consistently worse the farther I go, and frankly, I wasn't having enough fun to find out for sure. I'm sure I'll get plenty of angry comments over this, but I'm standing by myself on this one. If you like playing Bowser's Minions, then more power to you. But if you're like me and only enjoy Minion Quest for the fan service, I suggest watching the cutscenes on YouTube instead.
All that being said, let's get into the final verdict. Remake or Rebreak? How well does Superstar Saga hold up as a game on its own, and how well does Superstar Saga plus Bowser's Minions recreate and improve upon that original experience? On the whole, I'd say Superstar Saga holds up better than I expected. The visuals are still crisp and colorful, and the music and sound design hold up wonderfully 15 years later. The Bean Bean Kingdom is as lively a setting as ever, and the platforming and puzzle elements are incredibly engaging. While battles aren't quite as bombastic as they'll get, in later games, Brothers' moves are at least fast-paced, and dodging or countering enemies will always keep you on your toes. Most importantly, I had to applaud Superstar Saga for its character, charm, and timeless sense of humor. The world of the Bean Bean Kingdom and its quirky inhabitants reel me in, and the dialogue never ceases to put a smile on my face. While not the greatest Mario RPG I've ever played, Superstar Saga remains a fun romp in 2018. However, playing the game again helped me to realize how much room there was to improve. For capitalizing on that, I award the 3DS version a remake score. As fun as it is to platform around and solve puzzles, trying to switch between all of these moves with L and R is just cumbersome, especially after Paper Jam streamlined this feature on the touchscreen. Superstar Saga has a much broader moveset than that game, so the addition of a permanent jump button and touchscreen swapping in the remake is something that's hard to go back from. Additionally, the GBA version poorly tutorializes brothers' moves, particularly the advanced versions, to the point that I had to look them up online. Thus, the ability to demo and practice brothers' moves along with better telegraph button timings refines the system considerably. While I consider these the major improvements, I also have to draw attention to the multitude of minor enhancements and additions I noticed across the review. Some highlights include the improved touchscreen map system with ability to drop markers, faster hand attacks, ability to fast forward cutscenes and tutorials, new chuckle bean tallies in the menu, outlines on he bean blocks, etc. Let's also not forget the new visuals, which run at a consistent 60 FPS and excellently reimagined fan favorite bean bean locales. While I I did find the new sound design to be understated, the new music was for the most part an improvement, with only a few exceptions. As a longtime fan of the series, I especially appreciate efforts to tweak dialogue and characterization to bring Superstar Saga in line with series continuity, as well as all the references to future games. Of course, there are a few minor drawbacks here and there, like the removal of a facial expression there, or a non-anti-aliased overworld object there, but by and large the 3DS version improves far more often than it detracts, if you ask me. For that reason, I'm confident in giving Bowser's Minions at least a remake score. However, the best remakes which I score as replaces aren't just the ones that improve, but also those that add meaningful new content. Unfortunately, that's where Bowser's Minions fails the most, especially given its namesake. I do appreciate the new achievement system, and especially the in-game music test, but these are hardly amazing additions. And then there's the massive disappointment that is Minion Quest, one of the shallowest games I've ever played. Again, I do enjoy the cutscenes and especially the fan service, but if I can't stand to sit through the boring automated battles to get to them, I might as well just watch them on YouTube instead. Beyond the unnecessary automation, the AI is terrible, trying to figure out the right units to bring is a total crapshoot, and the game throws in stats and grinding where they really don't belong. Minion Quest is a chore to play, to the point I couldn't bother finishing it, and I have a hard time recommending it to all but the most hardcore Mario & Luigi fans. Fans. Seeing as Minion Quest is meant to be the 3DS remake's trump card, the fact that it's so underwhelming sets back the remake's standing on the whole. However, bearing in mind how much the 3DS version improves in the main game, I think Remake is an appropriate score for this one. If Minion Quest had more mechanical depth and removed grinding from the equation, I would be more willing to bump Bowser's minions up to a replay score. On the whole though, I would definitely recommend the 3DS version to newcomers and veterans alike. While the GBA version is still a fine way to play Superstar Saga, once you've experienced all the gameplay improvements on 3DS, it's kind of hard to go back. With Superstar Saga covered, the focus inevitably turns to what comes next. Well, I say one episode on the beginning of a celebrated Nintendo RPG series deserves another. Join me next time for a much requested episode on Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow versus Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green. Since I know next to nothing about the intricacies of Pokemon mechanically or competitively, I'll be bringing along one of my closest YouTube friends to fill in the gap of my knowledge. We'll also be splitting up the Gen 1 originals and remakes between ourselves to cut down on fatigue. It's gonna be a big project, but knowing how many people have requested Pokemon on Roar, I'm sure you're all looking forward to it. If you've liked today's review, make sure to give it a like and consider subscribing for more reviews. You can also find me on the Inverse Cast, where I meet up with Hadox, Ryrule, and King K to talk about video games and read bad fanfiction. You can find video versions of the podcast on YouTube and an audio version on SoundCloud. We'll actually be rebooting the channel soon, 
description, so be sure to keep your eyes in the community tab. I also have a Let's Play channel, EPG Plays, where I offer informative playthroughs of games I like and some I don't. It's also the new home of Zebro's Play, sillier playthroughs I do with my brother. Right now I've got an EPG Plays of Spyro Enter the Dragonfly and Spyro Season of Ice, as well as a Zebro's Play of Wind Waker with my brother screwing me over on Tingle Tuner. I can, oh, you know the part with the pea hats that's hard? Yeah. Once you get close, I can use the shield, Michael. Teamwork. Alright, let's do it. It costs 40 rupees. Do I even have that much? Yeah, you have 44. Alright, use the potion. Right. right now? Yes. Eh, yeah, never mind. I almost messed it up too. <laughs> I'm sure, it, like, it, if you watch the video and post, I was fumbling around a little bit. Special thanks also goes out to my friend Nick on Planet Ripple for hooking me up with this sweet new border. Until next time, I'm Exo, and I hope you all enjoyed the review.